right? People are starting to trickle in. All right, hi everybody. Um, welcome to another awesome session as a part of HDO Congress. Um, this session is with Dr. Kelly Atkins from Australia, and she's going to share her research on apathy in Huntington's disease. Um, Kelly has been a great supporter of HDO in recent years with her fundraising efforts, and we're very honored and excited to have you speaking with us today. If you guys have any questions during the presentation, uh, you can put them in the Q&A and we will do a question and answer session at the end. So thank you, Kelly, and the floor is yours. Perfect. Thank you so much. So as I said, um, my name is Kelly and today I'm going to talk about apathy in Huntington's disease. So uh, before I get started, I know that a lot of us are joining in from all over the world uh, today. Obviously, we weren't able to meet together in person. Uh, so where am I? So right now I'm down here in Australia. Now, this is a really large country and it's pretty far away from the rest of the world. We're about 10 hours into the future here. So um, 10 hours ahead of the UK, which makes it 7.30 in the morning on Sunday. Now, normally I live right down here in this city called Melbourne, uh, but right now I'm actually on holidays. And so I'm up here in Queensland. Now these places seem, you know, they're both in Australia, they're both on the East coast, but they are really different. So whereas it's about, it's a miserable sort of 10 degrees in Melbourne today, it's really cold. It's uh, looking to be 30 degrees here in Queensland. So really different temperatures right across Australia. Okay, so now you know where I am, but who am I and, and why am I here talking to you guys today? So as I said, my name is Kelly and I work here in Australia as a neuropsychologist and as a researcher with people affected by HD. So as a neuropsychologist, my job is to work with people who are experiencing changes in their thinking, their memory or their behavior. And these changes typically affect day-to-day -day activities like working, driving a car or living independently. So that's the sort of clinical role that I have. But my research has really been about the psychiatric symptoms or the mood-based changes that occur uh, in HD and how best we can measure them. Now, I've worked across this research across, across the world. So I uh, did some of this research in America. You've got a picture here of me at Yosemite National Park working on these posters that I presented about a week later at a HD conference. Now, measurement of symptoms doesn't really sound that sexy, and I'm not one of those people who's working on a cure for HD. I wish I was, but if we're going to be, uh, if we're going to uh, effectively treat HD, if we're going to design medicines that work, we need to be able to measure symptoms to use in our clinical trials. And so, measurement of symptoms is really important for that purpose, and, and that's where my work has come in. So today I'm going to talk specifically about apathy. Now, apathy is one of the most common psychiatric disorders that affects people with HD. So what exactly is it? So apathy is a disorder of motivation and it's caused by changes in the brain. Now, when I talk about apathy, I'm not talking about uh, feeling like you can't be bothered on, on a Saturday or a Sunday morning after a late night. I'm really talking about this um, changes in the brain that make it really difficult for people to engage with different activities. And so the effects of apathy at this level can be, uh, have really negative consequences. It can, affect, um, it can affect our ability to do the things we enjoy, to be interested in learning new things, to live independently and to look after ourselves. Now, we know that apathy also affects families because people with apathy tend to have more difficulty engaging socially or emotionally connecting to other people. From a healthcare perspective, apathy also makes it hard for clinicians to get people engaged in their treatments or their programs. So for example, someone with apathy might not do their physiotherapy exercises as often as we would recommend them to. And we know in HD, that's a really important thing. Now, 
often you might hear apathy confused with depression. Often they're sort of thought as apathy is often thought as a symptom of depression, but in HD and, and other brain diseases, uh, they're definitely different symptoms. What we, what we think is that they're different symptoms. So whereas a person with depression often has negative thoughts about themselves or a sense of feeling hopeless or sad, someone with apathy tends to be more emotionally neutral and they might appear indifferent or they might need prompts to do things. Now, it's important that we recognize these symptoms are different because they're likely to be measured differently and have different treatments. Okay, so how does the brain work to keep us motivated and what goes wrong for a person with apathy? So if we think about why it is we do things, we typically, we can relate most of our actions to the basic idea that we engage in a behavior in the hope that it will lead to some kind of positive outcome or a reward. Um, now, how much effort we put into something depends a lot on how uh, important or how much we value that reward. So we could use this hiker as an example. So here, the hiker has two mountains to choose from. There's a smaller mountain on the left and a much taller mountain on the right. Now, let's say there's a pizza at the top of each of these mountains. So in this case, the hiker might choose the smaller mountain uh, because they can walk less and get a whole pizza to themselves. What if we had three pizzas at the top of this larger mountain? Would that change our decision? Perhaps the hiker is really hungry and would prefer to walk a little bit further to get two extra pizzas. Now, in a, in a person with a healthy brain, this is how decisions are made. We weigh up how much effort we, put, we need to put in and whether the outcomes on offer are worth that amount of effort. Now, unfortunately in HD and other brain diseases, the parts of the brain that help us to make these decisions are affected. And one of two things can happen. Either the rewards become less appealing so in this case, the hiker might be completely indifferent to pizza or the perceived effort can become much greater. So again, in this example, the mountains could become seemingly impossible to climb no matter how much pizza we have at the top. Now, experimental psychologists usually study apathy using that effort and reward framework that I just described. And that was certainly something that I did in my um, PhD. But as a psychologist working with a person that has apathy, we're likely to think about how it, how it presents in the clinic and how it affects uh, a person's day-to-day -day activities. We know that there are three key subtypes of apathy that a person might present within the clinic. The first one is what we call behavioral apathy. Now, this is a difficulty in getting self-started. So that difficulty with initiation of an activity. And so a person here, a person with this type of apathy might have difficulty um, getting started and might need prompts to do things. So they might have to be asked to do things. The next type of apathy is what we call emotional apathy. And this can lead to difficulties in engaging emotionally and socially with people. We might find it harder to connect with our friends or family and our feelings might be dampened down a bit. So we might not feel our feelings as intensely as, as we previously did. The last type of apathy is what we call cognitive apathy. And uh, this is a difficulty in putting together all of the necessary steps to carry out a behavior or an action. And people with this type of apathy um, might have difficulty also in deciding what it is they want to do for a day or deciding what needs to be done and in what order it should be done. So what are our priorities for the day? Now, in the first study of my doctorate, we wanted to know which of these subtypes affected, a, a, affected people with HD. And to do that, we used a relatively new questionnaire that hadn't been used in HD before. And it separates each of these subtypes of apathy. So we asked people with the HD gene expansion, both with and without motor symptoms of HD, as well as people without the HD gene expansion to complete the apathy questionnaire. We also asked one of their family members to complete it about them. You know, we did this so that we could see what people with the HD gene felt about their apathy 
and how this compared to their family members and how they thought it affected them. So what did we find? Well, uh, here, um, this graph is showing us how people with the HD gene expansion scored on each of those subscales of apathy compared to their partner. Now, just to orient you to this graph, there's a lot going on, I can see that, but on the, the left vertical Y axis, uh, we have how highly people scored on this questionnaire. So the higher the score, the more apathy they were experiencing. On the horizontal X axis, we can see three, the three subtypes of apathy. So the cognitive, behavioral and emotional apathy. Now, what we can see on this graph is that people with HD symptoms, and they're shown by the red bars, had higher levels of apathy than people who were pre-symptomatic. So without any uh, signs of the motor symptoms of HD. And they're shown by the purple bars here. We also found that people with HD and their family members rated uh, apathy in a similar way. Now, this is shown by the similarity between the completely coloured bars and the partially shaded bars. And we saw that this effect for both people with and without symptoms of HD. And what that suggests is that people with HD are pretty aware of their apathy symptoms and how they might affect their behaviour. So this next graph shows us the number of people who scored in what we call a clinical range of apathy. Uh, this is a level of apathy that we would expect to really affect people's day-to-day -day activities. So again, we know that apathy occurs on a spectrum and what we're talking about is apathy at this high end of, high end of a spectrum of, of a motivation or, or not having enough motivation. And um, that's, that's the sort of symptom we're talking about. Now, again, to orient you to the graph, the left vertical axis shows us the percentage of people in each of the participant groups who scored above this clinical range. On the y-axis, we've then again got these subtypes of apathy. Uh, we've got three groups of people in this figure. So the, the red bars, again, show people with the HD gene that have symptoms. The purple bars are people that have the HD gene, but without symptoms, motor symptoms, and the orange bars are people that don't have the gene expansion. Now, what we found here was that people with uh, HD symptoms, motor symptoms, were more likely to have clinical apathy, and this occurred for every level, for every subtype that I talked about before. So the behavioural, the emotional, and the cognitive apathy, compared to people in both the pre-symptomatic and um, non-HD groups. What we also found that was interesting though, was that people uh, in the pre-symptomatic period still had more apathy than people without the gene expansion. Uh, again, this wasn't as much as people with motor symptoms of HD, but, but it was more than what we would have normally expected. So what does this actually mean? What does it tell us? So we learned two things from this study. The first is that people uh, affected by HD experience apathy in, in lots of different ways. So all of those subtypes that I talked about at the beginning can affect a person with HD. And it's likely that no two people with HD are going to experience these symptoms in exactly the same way. We also learned that apathy affects people really early. So before they develop the motor signs of HD. And what that means is that we need to make sure we're helping people well before, um, well before a diagnosis of HD. Um, and if we can uh, help people as early as possible, that's a good thing. Okay, so now that we know that people with HD experience apathy in many different ways, and we know that they are relatively aware of it, uh, how do people with HD describe apathy? This is something that we wanted to know. And so this was the last, uh, this was the aim of the last study that I did as part of my PhD. We wanted to understand how people with HD experienced apathy, how they described it, and how they thought it affected their day-to-day -day activities. Now, this is really important. Now, understanding um, how people experience apathy is really important, particularly from a measurement perspective, because we need our questionnaires 
of symptoms to match up with how people experience those symptoms. And we need, to, we need, if they don't match up, it means that we might be measuring something completely different to what we think we are. So uh, in the previous study, I talked about that questionnaire that we used. How do we know that that questionnaire is measuring apathy and not something else like depression or like fatigue? And so that's why we did this last study. We wanted to really understand how people describe their symptoms of apathy. So we asked them. Um, one person said, I don't know if it's just me and I'm lazy or if it's part of the disease, uh, <clears throat> but I have difficulty sometimes getting up off the couch and doing things. So they're really talking about a difficulty initiating an activity or self-starting an activity. This person described everyday activities as becoming more difficult, tiring, emotionally more difficult and, and just harder. So there's a few different things in here that we can see. There's this idea that things become more effortful, which is what I talked about at the very beginning. So those mountains becoming more effortful. Here, day-to-day -day activities are becoming more effortful. They're also becoming emotionally more harder, so harder to invest emotionally in them and to really care about what it is you're doing. And they can become tiring as well, which is a real, uh, is a tricky part of our measurement because we know that apathy and fatigue can really cross over a bit. Now, this last person said, I feel bad. I feel sad sometimes because I'll be at home. I might put on the TV and then that's it. But as soon as she texted me, I thought, oh, this is a really good day to get out. Uh, this woman is talking about being at home and not really doing much, really wanting to get out and feeling like she was just sort of stuck at home and feeling a bit sad because of that. But as soon as she was prompted by one of her friends to go for a walk, she thought, gosh, I'm glad that this is happening. I'm glad I'm going for a walk. I'm glad I'm getting out. And this one's really important because it helps us to understand that people that have apathy don't necessarily not enjoy doing things. They still get pleasure and enjoyment from doing the activities they like. It's just much harder to start them. Okay, so what do we think helps? So based on the, the research that I did throughout my PhD and from working in the clinic with people with HD, there are some things that we think can help people who experience apathy and perhaps limit how much it affects a person's day-to-day -day life. So the first suggestion is to get involved in activities with other people. Um, join, this might mean joining a club, joining a team, but what this is, is, is a support network that can prompt you and support you in what you're doing. And again, we saw this in one of the previous examples, just how much having someone to prompt you to do something can be really helpful. The other one is to get into a bit of a routine or to stick to a schedule. So what, what we mean by this is sort of doing a similar thing each week at the same time. And an example of that is that on Thursday nights at six o'clock, I am part of a running group. So every Thursdays, every Thursday after work, I know it's my running night and I don't plan anything else um, because I know that I've, I've got plans. And in that way, running for me becomes a habit. And this is important because we know that getting into really good habits now and then sticking with them um, down the track is, is really helpful. Most people that we interviewed um, were still participating in activities that they had liked and had done for a really long time. So it might have been a sport that they'd played since their you know, 20s or 30s, tennis or golf, uh, or it could have been like a community group, like painting or creative writing. But whatever it was, it was a habit and it was simply a part of their daily or weekly routine. And what this means is that you don't have to think of the activity yourself. You don't have to initiate the activity yourself. It just comes naturally, like the way we automatically brush our teeth before bed. So if we start now and then we continue right through the lifespan without habits, it's a really good way to, to make these positive habits that you can then keep for a really long time. The last one is 
is to get help early. So some of these uh, things that I've talked about today, you might recognize in, you might have recognized in yourself, you might have recognized it in someone close to you. Um, and what we would suggest for that, if, if that is you, if, if you do identify with that, is to talk to somebody now. So um, the earlier we get help, the earlier we recognize these sorts of symptoms, the easier it is for us to put in place um, routines or um, habits that we can stick to. And so I would certainly encourage you to, to get in touch with, with someone if this is something that you're experiencing or if it's something that you've noticed in somebody else. Okay, so that's actually all from me today. That's all I wanted to, to talk to you about. But if you do have any questions, I'm more than happy to chat. And you can also email me if you've um, got something you'd like to talk about offline. Thanks. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kelly. Um, no worries. We do have a few questions. Um, the one I want to just touch on just from that previous slide. Um, mm -hmm. You mentioned, you know, if you're recognizing these signs in yourself or other people that you should talk to somebody. Um, mm. Who are those somebody? Who should people reach out to in that case? Yeah, sure. So I guess it depends a little bit on, on who you're engaged with. I would say that if you're part of any kind of, um, if you have uh, someone that you see in the context of HD, that can also that can be really helpful. Often, um, I know here in Australia we have uh, HD clinicians that will help people get engaged with the community. So that might be, you know, helping someone to find a community group that suits them, or um, or making a, a chart for what it is that they'll do each week. Um, and that can be for people that are experiencing symptoms of HD, as well as people who, you know, might just have a family member with HD. Um, so uh, that would be my first suggestion. I also think um, maybe talking to, to friends and family and, and sort of um, just saying, I'm actually having a bit of trouble, you know, getting, getting started with stuff. Do you think that maybe, you know, we could set up something together? So um, you know, maybe you have a friend that, you know, likes to go for walks or that you can get coffee with or um, that, you know, likes to do different kinds of um, painting or arts or whatever it might be that you're interested in and that your friends are interested in. If you set up like a club or a team of, of a group of people that you do something with, that would be another, another option. Um, yeah. Awesome. I like those. Uh, in, engaging other people to keep Keep yourself yeah. too, right? Um, exactly. you, which I think is great. Um, what I'm curious about, and maybe this is because I read one of those quotes and related to that so well, where, you know, I've gone through spouts of depression and stuff like that. So for me, I'm curious. Um, I've tested positive and, and I'm not shy about that, but how long before HD, so that pre-HD, how far in advance can somebody recognize this? And how can, for somebody like myself, identify that that's maybe something to do with apathy and less to do with depression? Yeah, it's a really good question. And uh, so from, a, from the studies that I talked about today, the people that were pre-symptomatic um, were up to around 10 years prior to what we would think is their estimated time of onset of, of motor symptoms. So it, it, can, it can start to happen really early. I think teasing it apart from depression is a bit trickier. So how do we know if it's apathy or if it's a symptom of depression? And we know that, uh, we know that apathy can be a symptom of depression. So they can occur separately, but they can also occur together. And I think if, if that were me and I was thinking about my mood and I wasn't sure, you know, if I felt like I was having difficulty getting started with something, I might try to think about whether I have other symptoms of depression. So, you know, do I feel, you know, my thinking negative thoughts about either myself or about stuff that's going on around me? You know, do I feel kind of sad? Do I feel down? Or is it the case that once I get started on something with my friends, I have a great time and I'm really enjoying it? And thinking about those things and, and maybe talking to your doctor or, or a psychologist is another good way to tease those things apart. And if we're feeling depressed, then we can get treatment for that. We have medicines that work for that. We have um, sort of behavioral things that we know work for that. 
Uh, and so I would treat that first. And then if, if apathy is still happening, then we can put in more of those sort of changes around your environment. So there are things like family and friends, there are things like reminders in your phone, there are things like um, making sure you've got sort of a plan of attack for the week and, and sort of not making, um, not making yourself so responsible for getting started because it's really hard and it's a change in the brain. And so it's not something that, you know, it's apathy isn't that we're lazy or that we're not trying hard enough. It's actually something that's happening in the brain. And so we need help from outside. Yeah, that's interesting. I'm definitely going to be like a little bit more curious, right? Like when those mm. moments happen, what am I feeling? What's am I? Yeah. Um, and hopefully the others do the same, you know, it could be a big change in the way that you treat it and the way that you get help. So um, thank you for that. Um, we have another question and it says, how much is related to brain fatigue? Yeah, it's a really great question. Um, and this was something that came up time and time again throughout all of the studies that I was doing was this overlap between apathy and fatigue. So is it that I can't be bothered or that I'm not motivated or is it just I'm really tired? And th that came up time and time again. And I think this is a, a challenge that we're still facing as a as a research group is really trying to understand what is fatigue and what is apathy and, and are those two things uh, related or, or similar? I definitely think that fatigue plays into apathy. So if we're feeling fatigued, we're definitely, you know, we're typically less enthusiastic about doing things. So I think there is a real overlap. I, I do think that fatigue is related to apathy. Um, and so then we talk about more making sure that we're getting enough sleep, making sure that we're taking periods of rest if we need them. So if you need to rest, making sure that you've given yourself space to rest and, um, and you know, understand that, again, it's not that you're being lazy. It's not that you're not trying hard enough that, you know, those things can, you know, fatigue and brain fatigue can be a really debilitating sort of symptom so making sure we've got enough rest making sure that we're getting enough sleep are other ways that we can help with fatigue but also with apathy that might be related to our fatigue awesome thank you um i hope that answered your question yes Hopefully. Um, we have another one that just came in and it says, I'm interested to hear patients are aware of their apathy. I often thought the apathy itself almost protected people from an awareness that they are not doing as many activities as they used to or are not able being as motivated as they used to be. Mm -hmm. Can cognitive behavioral ther theories help reduce the amount of apathy that someone experiences? like meditation? Yeah, right. Uh, so the, the first part around uh, sort of being aware of our symptoms is an interesting one. And I think what would be important to, to note with the studies that we talked about is that um, these are people that aren't necessarily experiencing a lot of changes in their thinking at the moment. So we know that as our thinking changes in terms of um, our memory and how well we can concentrate and pay attention and all of those thinking related changes that typically happen um, for a person that has HD, that can affect how much we notice symptoms about ourselves. Um, so that, that's the, the first thing that I would just sort of mention. Um, I also think that while people might be able to be aware that they're not engaging in as many activities as they were, how much they are bothered by that is a little bit different. So I think if we asked people if they were bothered and we compared it to how much their family members were bothered, that there would be a bit of a difference. Um, typically, we find people that uh, have apathy don't really mind that they're not doing things, particularly in those sort of um, really severe cases, whereas family members often are really concerned by it and are really worried by it. Um, the second one in terms of treatments, in terms of, I think it was CBT you said, and maybe mindfulness, yeah. So um, it's a great question. I think 
that it really, again, depends on other symptoms. So, and again, what kind of, what kind of person it is we're talking about? Is it a person that is pre-symptomatic and that is um, not experiencing really any changes in their thinking and memory? Um, those sorts of therapies might be really helpful. I think that the, once we have, once a person has uh, the cognitive changes that occur with HD, it can become a lot harder to do CBT. CBT sort of relies on being able to, to identify thoughts that are maybe negative and, and maybe not founded by the facts and then being able to challenge those ideas. And that can take a lot of, that's a, it's a big cognitive load. Um, so as it really depends on the stage of, um, of where a person's at. Um, in terms of mindfulness, I think that's a really interesting idea. And it's actually not something that I know a lot about. Uh, my first initial thought would be that it, sort of changes to the environment can be really helpful. Um, but maybe mindfulness is another one that, that can as well. And, um, you know, if, if that person is interested in finding out, I can definitely have a bit of a, a scan of the literature and, and see what I can find and, and get back to you. Okay, awesome. We will work on getting those details from that person. Um, if that attendee wants to send just me a message or the panelist a message, um, we can get you those details. Thank you for that. Um, so thank you so much, Dr. Atkins. I thoroughly enjoyed that and it gave me some things to talk think about. Um, and I'm sure everybody else as well, because it's this world of HD, the knowledge of HD just keeps growing and growing and growing. Um, but the more we know, the better we can be prepared, right? Um, so thank you for that. Um, and thank you for everybody for tuning in. Um, we now have uh, the brilliant Dr. Jeff Carroll sharing his HD story happening on track one. And on track two, we have Doc or Prof Hugh Rickards talking about the incredibly important notion of getting new HD treatments to patients globally. So you guys can check out and go check them out. Take care. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Kelly, can you see that? Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. I'll just, um, I'll write it down. Okay. Sounds good. S-R-F-Y-W-Y-W-K-A-M-S-Y-W-K-A-M-S-Y-W-K-A-M-S-Y-W-K-A-M-S-Y-W-K-A-M-S-Y-W-K-A-M-S-Y-W-K-A-M-